Hi everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to biology class. Today we'll be tackling the subject of evolution. Now, evolution is a topic I know a lot about. I was once on the California State Committee to formulate evolution standards for California uh, challenge schools. And so um, in my adult life, I have studied evolution uh, quite a lot. Um, I'd like to share some of that knowledge with you today. Today we'll be taking a look at these topics here, one through four evolution terms and now, in order to have a uh, intelligent discussion of evolution, there's some key terms that you'll need to be familiar with. Um, then we'll take a look at uh, other scientists' contributions to the idea of not just evolution, but adding to the climate of, uh, of the, the times so that when Darwin came along in the 1800s and proposed his uh, theory of evolution, uh, the, the time was ripe. Um, we'll take a look at Darwin's ideas specifically look at his background and then also we'll take a look at his four ideas or four tenets he called them and then we will take a short look at uh, lines of evidence for evolution let's go ahead and get started here's some evolution terms and the first one is evolution itself evolution means change over time things evolve um, uh, and so uh, if you are still playing that uh, Pokemon Go game, uh, or if you collected the cards way back in the day, in the 2000s, you know that even Pikachu evolves. Pikachu evolves into Raichu. And so that is just a silly example of a change over time. But evolution doesn't mean that a man came from a monkey necessarily. Um, evolution is any change over time. Now, um, there are small changes that occur over time within a species. No one argues with this idea, which is called microevolution. Um, during the during historical times, we can see that the average heights of populations change over time. Um, even in the, uh, in the United States, uh, the average height of the uh, average American male has increased uh, several inches. Uh, probably that is due to advances in medical science and improved nutrition. So yes, things change over over 200 years. Over a small period of time, you'll see small cha changes uh, that occur in characteristics within a species. The idea that some people debate is uh, what's called macroevolution. Macroevolution is also called speciation. It says here, over time, groups of organisms change so much that they can no longer reproduce with the original group. One example that is often uh, studied is that of a population of squirrels live in the southwestern United States called the Kaibab squirrels. And uh, the idea is that there are a population of squirrels on either side of a creek, some on the north, some on the south, but over time as that creek became a stream and that stream became a river and that river carved into the, into the topography of the area and became, it became the Grand Canyon. So over time, those squirrels were separated geographically. And because those squirrels were separated geographically, uh, the populations uh, were no longer able to reproduce with each other. So over a long, long period of time, those two populations on the north and the south of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River uh, became separate populations that could no longer reproduce with each other. 
So then now they are considered to be two different species. An adaptation is a trait that allows an organism to survive and reproduce. For example, a, uh, the big ears in a, in a desert fox. You would think that uh, those big ears, how do they, how do they allow the, or help the desert fox to live in an environment? Um, perhaps it's, uh, it's, it's large ears give it shade from the sun, or more likely uh, a couple of things, those, those large ears would uh, be very thin tissue that has a lot of blood going through there and is a way for the animal to get rid of extra heat very rapidly. It also could be that, that those large ears could help the, uh, help the fox uh, hear predators uh, even just a little better uh, so that it can make its getaway before it gets eaten up. So those are adaptations. Those are traits that allow an organism to survive and reproduce. Now, in a population, individuals will have different traits. Um, maybe those uh, those foxes uh, had some had some individuals in the population have very large ears. Some have very small ears, but over time, it was always the ones with the largest with the largest ears that were most successful in leaving more offspring. So the, the uh, percentage of, of individuals with large ears in the population increased over time. Uh, that is because of this variation. Some had large ears, some had small ears. So that's variation. Now mutation, a lot of people put uh, too much into this, but mutation is simply a change in the DNA. Uh, you probably uh, have, have had changes in your DNA and you aren't even aware of them. Um, and I wrote, most changes have no effect. Some are lethal and a few make an individual better adapted. So you probably don't even know when you have a mutation in your DNA. Um, there have been maybe times when that change could kill you, but even less likely, is the chance that a change in your DNA would make you and uh, better adapted to your environment. And so um, you would leave more offspring and those offspring would have that change in the DNA and perhaps that characteristic. Another idea that's important to the idea of evolution is competition, that individuals are competing for resources and those resources are limited, whether it's food or water, or it might be uh, suitable uh, places to live. It might be the ability to get rid of waste products. So competing for limited resources, this competition is, a set, is what is said to derive the uh, the machine of evolution. And then here is the working definition for what we call species. Ernest Mayer, uh, a famous uh, biologist from the uh, early 20th century, uh, said that species are groups of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. So our squirrels were reproductively isolated. Um, so um, if you have uh, interbreeding natural populations, uh, those are organisms where you have individuals that, that uh, could theoretically produce viable offspring. In my example on the pictures here, you see a horse, a donkey, and a mule. A mule is not a species. You make a a mule by getting a horse and a donkey together and they have an offspring called a mule. But these offspring are not fertile. So this is since mules don't constitute a species of organisms. And then another term is fitness. Fitness is the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its environment. 
So organisms may have increased fitness because they have certain adaptations and they have those adaptations simply because there's variation in a population. They may have that variation in a population because they had a mutation which would um, code for that adaptation which increases their fitness. Let's go ahead and take a look at other scientists' contributions to the idea of evolution. Uh, here we have Lamarck. Lamarck was a, a biologist who came up with the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, which is often uh, known also as the idea of use and disuse. Um, silly example. I took calculus when I was a freshman in college. I didn't have to use it again until my senior year of college. I did pretty well in calculus in the beginning, but after three years of not using that calculus knowledge, when I actually had to use it again, whew, that was not a good time in my academic uh, achievement. Uh, Lamarck. He says the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I used to lift weights a lot in my 20s. Um, and then uh, my wife and I had our first son when, uh, when I was 25. Um, was, uh, did my, my son, uh, was he born with, uh, with uh, unusually large muscles? Uh, was he totally ripped when we when he first came out, no. So those acquired characteristics are not uh, passed along. Um, the inheritance of the acquired characteristics are for characteristics that are on the DNA. And um, so if you have a variation, then that variation is coded by the DNA. And that DNA then is what is passed along. So inheritance of acquired characteristics, that idea was disproven, but Lamarck's ideas were necessary to set the stage for the acceptance of the idea of the theory of evolution. So, um, Let's take a look at someone else. Let's take a look at Hutton. Hutton was actually a geologist. And I wrote, geological forces occur over long periods of time. This was uh, not a generally accepted idea in the early 1800s. Uh, they thought that the earth was much younger than what most uh, geologists would would uh, say today. Today, the age of the Earth is estimated at 4.6 billion years old. Um, so if that's the case, then uh, that's enough time for Hutton's ideas that geological forces have enough time to make their changes in the in the uh, Earth's uh, Earth's uh, topography. So that's Hutton. And um, Malthus was actually not a scientist, but Althus, Malthus was an economist. And uh, his uh, major idea was that the population will increase faster than any resources. Now, uh, with the human population, if you have more people, they might uh, take the resources and be able to manufacture more things, but there will come a time when that population uh, will uh, overtake the um, the idea that that the manufacturing will help the population um, continue its rate of increase. So the population rate will increase much faster than the resources. And because this is true, there's going to be some competition for those resources. So that's an idea from um, economics that is used to 
um, used in the idea of the development of the theory of evolution. As you know, the father of evolution is Charles Darwin, and he did his work in the 1800s. Um, it started in 1809 when he was named the naturalist on the uh, on the ship, the HMS, Her Majesty's Ship Beagle. Um, and uh, while it was uh, sailing in you know, South America, uh, Darwin was able to make some observations on the on the east coast of South America that, that led him to uh, formulate his ideas. Um, and then finally, when he got to the Galapagos Islands, uh, he was able to uh, make some observations that pushed it over the top. And um, and that was the, the beginning of the development of his idea of the theory of evolution. It took him quite a long time to uh, come up with this idea and um, percolate it in his mind until he was able to share it publicly. Uh, in 1865, he published his hallmark book, on the origin of species. Um, historically, they say it was motivated because of his uh, colleague, Alfred Wallace, who he, um, who he spoke with, he uh, corresponded with, and he, Charles Darwin, released his work uh, before Wallace could release his very similar ideas. So that is how we know Charles Darwin as the father of evolution. Some people give Wallace credit and call it the uh, Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution. Now, evolution has four main ideas. Here they are here. First, more organisms are made than the environment can support. So we saw that earlier that comes from from the writings of Malthus, and because there are more organisms made than the environment can support, this leads to competition between individuals uh, to uh, obtain the, the resource. Idea number one, uh, Darwin's first tenet. The second idea is that there is already variation among the offspring. So that's not just an adaptation, but it's a pre-adaptation. Uh, we, as individuals, are pre-adapted for certain environments, and then when we are placed in those environments, then that is advantageous. Idea number three is the perhaps the main idea, and that is the idea of natural selection, also called survival of the fittest. The environment selects against traits, so sometimes people will say that uh, the that natural selection selects characteristics, but actually what, what happens in evolution is that uh, you have uh, all kinds of different uh, characteristics or traits, and the environment then selects against, not for traits. Those environmental issues may be something as simple as, as the daily weather patterns or the seasonal climate patterns, but it could also be biological competition between organisms, between predators and, and prey. It could be environmental, uh, it could be pollution, it could be all kinds of different things. It could be environmental issues that select against the adaptations or the lack of adaptations that an individual might have. Our very best example of natural selection is uh, called uh, Bistin betularia, which is the peppered moth. Um, the peppered moth and industrial melanism we'll get to in, in just a few slides, um, but it is the best example of natural selection. And then we have the idea that individuals that have desirable traits are more fit, they have an increased fitness. And so 
individuals with an increased fitness are able to leave more offspring so that the genes or those characteristics uh, will be more persistent in the population. Now let's take a look at, uh, at some examples of these four ideas. Um, the first one is that here's a picture of a, um, a peacock displaying its tail feathers. So more organisms are made and the environment can support. So this guy is certainly competing. He has uh, quite a beautiful display of his tail feathers, which is sure to attract uh, peahens that are very near him. Uh, there is a variation among offspring. In our human population, people have different eye colors. Some have blue, some have green, some have brown. There are all kinds of colors in between. These are pre-adaptations for your environment. Um, it may be that people in more tropical regions uh, might have a darker hue to uh, their, their eyes. Uh, and that may make them more uh, adapted to the environment that they live in. Uh, whereas people who live in uh, much, much colder regions might have a different color, which allows more light to come into their, to their pupils. So pre-adaptation, you have what you have, but uh, those characteristics may make you more fit to live in a certain environment. Natural selection, again, something in the environment selects against those who have traits. And so whatever is left is a winner. If you take a look at the example of Biston betularia or the peppered moth on the first picture here, here is a photograph of a tree before the Industrial Revolution in the 1870s in England, and you have two different variants or morphs of the same species of moth. And if you didn't see it right away, here is a peppered moth. Here is, this is also a peppered moth, but the black form of the peppered moth. If you saw both of these on a tree, if you were a bird, you would swoop down and, and eat up that black one right there. And so this was before the Industrial Revolution when, when people came along and when the factories uh, continued to pollute. What we see over here is these trees not only are these trees covered with the soot from the coal, but we also see that we also see that the um, that the peppered moth uh, in this form is more visible, and so before the environmental change occurs. Uh, you have the black form, which is probably um, in a much lower percentage. But over here, you have the peppered moth, which now is at risk of decreasing in its percentage. So the pollution would be the environmental factor. And what you would see is that you would see a change in percentages of these forms over time before and after the environmental effect. And then finally, we have individuals that have desirable traits are more fit and leave more offspring. So, um, so if you have more desirable traits, you are more likely to leave uh, offspring that are better fit because of their uh, because of their adaptations to the environment, and then those offspring will leave more offspring. All righty, before we uh, stop for today, let's take a look at the lines of evidence for evolution. Uh, those include the fossil record, homologous structures, embryology, biochemistry, and biogeography. So when we take a look at the fossil record, Darwin himself said that uh, the fossil record will bear me out 
which means it'll prove without a shadow of a doubt whether this is true or not. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but um, but what we do see in the fossil record, and that fossil record is due to the stratification found in sedimentary rock. You see layers, and and those layers that go across are of the same uh, same time, same era. And so when you look at those sedimentary rocks, you may find fossils. Uh, fossils are the remnants of of uh, organisms, or maybe they even might be a mold, uh, which is uh, you know if the if a leaf say uh, gets stuck in the mud, and over time uh, the components of the leaf would go away, but the mold would be the imprint of the the leaf in the rock. So that's the idea of fossils. But just like um, if you were getting, say, uh, an old-fashioned paper newspaper at your house, I know we did when I was growing up, my dad would read the paper and put it in a pile then uh, after he was done reading it for the day. And the next day, the next morning, another paper came and he would read that and he would put it in a newspaper pile and it would get so high. And and so after after uh, getting you know to, uh, enough newspapers, it's time to throw it out. Which ones are on the top? Were the oldest ones on the top or the oldest ones on the bottom? And the answer, if you look at the analogy, is that the newest ones are on the top and the oldest ones are on the very bottom. So that's the idea of stratification and sedimentary rock. We can tell the relative time, um, relative age of a fossil according to where it is in the um, in the rock layer of so fossil records. Homologous structures are structures that are derived from the same tissue. And because they're derived from the same tissue, they must be related. And so if you take a look at the diagram here, you see that the bones of the different colors are homologous structures, but this is different from the idea of analogous structures. Analogous structures have the same function, like if you see this bat wing right here, the bat wing, is analogous to a bird's wing, which is analogous to an insect's wing. And all of these things have the same function and allow the organism to fly. We'll see that structurally speaking, these are all very different from each other. So uh, analogous structures versus homologous structures. Organisms that have analogous structures that are not necessarily not necessarily related, like an insect is not related to a bird just because they both fly. Another important uh, evidence for evolution is the vestigial organ, the organ that is there, but you no longer need it. So why is it there? Like for example, a whale still has a pelvis that has pelvic bones and why would it have a bone if you don't have why would you have a pelvis if you don't have legs attached to it so the idea here is that the whale is a mammal that must have come from an ancestor that originally lived on the land vestigial organ Another line of evidence is embryology. Vertebrates have similar embryos. Um, Haeckel, around the long same time as Darwin, uh, said the same as famous phrase in biology, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which means that the embryos look like the evolutionary sequence and they go from simple to complex. As you can see, here are Haeckel's drawings on the top here. And you can see that they do look very similar to each other. Um, here's some actual photographs, um, though, and so maybe embryology is uh, 
is not as uh, reliable an evidence as some of the other things. The more reliable evidence is the idea of biochemistry. Um, because if we take a look at the idea of cytochrome C, which is a protein, which is in the electron transport system, and the electron transport system, if you remember, is essential in uh, cellular respiration. And, and so many, many, many organisms have an electron transport system. So they carry, those organisms carry cytochrome C. The more similar your cytochrome C structure is to each other, the more likely you are related. Um, it's called a molecular clock because uh, we uh, make the assumption that the mutations in the DNA for cytochrome C change at a regular rate over time. So those cytochrome C DNA sequences uh, are very similar in related organisms and less similar in non-related organisms. Similarly, you can take a look at the amino acid structure for cytochrome C and see where those DNA's uh, mutations occurred. And you could calculate out, um, you can extrapolate and figure out when those um, two different species uh, split from each other and uh, went down a different evolutionary path. So evidence for evolution. Um, also, uh, biogeography is another line of evidence for evolution. When we take a look at the fossil records and we take a look at uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of Pangaea, you can see in this picture here, South America, Africa, Antarctica, India, and Australia were all together as one supercontinent 200 million years ago. So if you take a look over here, you can see that these fossils on the east coast of South America are similar to these fossils on the west coast of Africa. How could that be? Well, 200 million years ago, these guys were together like this in one supercontinent. And you can see that too for other organisms, other plants or animals. So that's a line of evidence for evolution. So um, there we go. Those are some ideas that I uh, wanted to introduce to you about the theory of evolution. Um, hope you learned something today. Thanks for coming to biology class. We'll see you next time. Bye now.